Well, hello, welcome to MOS Live. We have a really fun Ask a Scientist show for you today. We're talking all about how fish swim with some scientists who study fish biomechanics. And they'll explain what that means and tell us about some really interesting and maybe unexpected experiments that they're doing to learn more about how fish move. And they'll have a chance to take some questions from you. Now we'll get to meet our scientist friends in just a moment. But first, my name is Megan and my pronouns are she and her. And I am delighted to be your moderator for this program. Now, if you're joining us on Zoom, please feel free to start entering your questions for our panelists at any time by clicking the Q&A button on your screen. If you'd like captions, you can access those by clicking the closed caption button at the bottom of your screen and selecting show subtitles. If you're joining us on YouTube or Facebook, unfortunately, we cannot see your questions at this time, but we are thrilled that you're tuning in. All right, let's get started. I would like to invite our guest scientists to go ahead and turn on their cameras and their microphones and introduce themselves. Um, hello, hi, uh, I'm Cassandra Donatelli. Um, I am a postdoc at the University of Ottawa uh, in Ontario, Canada. Um, and I study uh, the way fish move based on their body shape. So if you've seen fishes in the store, you've probably seen that they have many, many different body shapes from long and skinny fish to really short and fat fish. Um, and I'm interested in how their different shapes help them to swim. Hi, I'm Keegan. I'm a PhD student at the University of Ottawa, uh, same place as Cassandra is, actually same lab. Um, and I, while I study some fish uh, swimming, what I'm really interested in is looking at how fish move in environments that where you wouldn't expect to find them. Um, so I do all sorts of weird things like taking uh, the little fish that we have and asking them to swim in kind of thick syrupy water. Um, taking them out of the water and placing them, them on land to see what they do in those kinds of environments and then try and backtrack and figure out how they've managed to move in whatever that way they have managed to do so. And I'm Eric Titel. I'm a, a professor at Tufts University in the biology department and I am studying right now how fish, how, how things work inside of the fish. So uh, how the muscles work and how they make the fish move and how the fish's nervous system tells the muscles what to do so that they can swim in different ways or swim faster or swim slower. Um, Great. Well, thank you so much for those introductions. We're so excited to have you all here. Thank you for being here. Um, and I'm looking forward to hearing a lot more from all of you. So now, before we get to our questions from the audience, um, I would like to start off with a couple of questions that I have for all of you. But for our audience uh, here on Zoom, remember that you can start entering your questions for our panelists at any time by using the Q&A button. And we're looking forward to getting to as many of those as we can in just a little bit. So now we're talking about how fish swim or the biomechanics of fish, which from your introduction sounds like it might be a little more complicated than it seems. So aside from this just being a really fascinating topic, why else is it important to understand how fish swim? So I can take part of that. Um... So, so one of the things we're really interested in is how the fish's nervous system works and how it controls how they're moving as they move through water. And the reason this is really helpful is that fish are vertebrates, just like us. They have a backbone and their, their nervous system that runs through their spinal cord um, is, is pretty much the same as ours. And so if we start to understand how the fish's nervous system controls its movement, that tells us something about the way we move. But the advantage is, is that fish's nervous system is a little bit simpler than ours. And so it's, our, ours is really hard to understand and fish is a little less hard to understand. Oh, I never thought about people and fish being so similar, but that's really interesting. Uh, Cassandra or Keegan, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, sure. So um, another reason that studying the way fish move and their biomechanics is important 
is because kind of like going off of what Eric said, they're vertebrates just like us and a lot of other extinct animals were also vertebrates. So if we under if we can understand um, the way fish move and we can understand how their body shape um, dictates their movement, we can then look back at extinct animals like the bones that you can see in my background and we can kind of make guesses about how those animals used to move as well. So. And it also tells us about how how life evolved on the planet. You know, we have hundreds and hundreds and thousands of species of fish, and some of those thousands of species of fish a long time ago came up on land and evolved into land animals. And so as we're understanding all of the different, the, the mechanics of how fish move today, it tells us something about older fish, but also tells us something about how we how we got the fish we have today and and even something about how we got the land animals we have today i bet keegan didn't tell us something about fish on land in that respect that's a very nice little segue for me <laughs> so i mean that's that's why i'm interested in uh figuring out what the fish that we have can do on land for example so we have fish um, that have some of the same shapes and uh, maybe fins that are similar to what uh, fish that might have first moved onto land way back when um, would look like. And so we can take these fish that we have now that are living now and we can play with now and see what they do in a terrestrial environment and see whether or not those changes are similar to some of the changes you saw during the evolution of terrestrial vertebrates. Um, the other cool thing about taking fish into environments that they don't normally go in is that we can then use some of the ideas of how those fish will control how they move in new environments and use that information to design robots that can move in flexible and different ways. So most of the time now a robot that is designed to swim only swims, but if we can figure out how fish that are basically designed to swim for the most part can move on land, we might be able to use some of those ideas to control robots that can do similar things. So then if you send a robot to the moon or someplace that we don't know a whole lot about the terrain, you have a better chance of having this flexible robot move in something, an environment like that. Wow. Robot fish on the moon. I love it. Uh, <laughs> super fascinating. Um, so it sounds like there's a lot of different ways that fish can move. What are some of the factors that, um, that affect how fish swim? I guess I can, I can start at least. Um, I'm going to steal a line from Cassandra, I guess, probably, and saying that one of the big things that influences how the fish move is their shape. Um, so if a fin is a different shape or different size, or even if the animal is a different shape or different size, that will directly influence how the water can move around the, fin, the fish and how the fin can interact with the water to make the fish move. So another big thing is the muscles inside of the fish. You know, fish have, um, just like us, fish have two different kinds of muscle. You know, if, if you eat meat and you have chicken, you know, there's dark meat chicken and there's white meat chicken. Well, there's dark meat fish and there's white meat fish as well. But the reason they're different is that the dark meat, that the, the red muscle, the dark meat is for sort of steady, efficient swimming over long periods of time. And the, the white part, um, the um, lighter colored muscle is for really sort of fast burst swimming. And so some fish have more red muscle, some fish have more white muscle, and that determines whether they can swim a long way, but maybe a little bit more slowly or fast, but in bursts. And also, last but not least, <laughs> lots of little pieces of the fish affect the way it moves too. So if you look at things like the bones or the skin, um, that can change the way uh, it, it, the fish will interact with its environment as well. So if it has really big, thick bones in its fins, it might be a fish that walks on land like Keegan's fish. Or if it's got really thin, very not dense bones, maybe it's a fish that lives in the deep sea and can move very efficiently there. Um, some fish skin has no scales on it and it's really smooth and slimy, which might help them to escape predators. Um, and some fish skin like sharks has uh, denticles on it. So denticles are basically like little teeth, very, very tiny teeth all over their skin. 
and that reduces drag, so it makes it easier for them to swim faster. Wow, so there's a lot of different shapes and forms of fish and it sounds like all these things affect how they swim. Um, so how, can you started talking about the evolution of fish a little bit. Um, so how, can you tell us a little bit more about how these different sizes and shapes of and behaviors of fish evolved? We're talking about how evolution works. Um, yeah. Sure, um, I could give that a try. Um, so evolution, it kind of happens slowly over time uh, as the fish kind of needs it. It's a weird way to, to phrase it, but like, for example, the fish that are going on land, Keegan probably can say a lot more about this. When they started going on land, they probably weren't very good at it. Um, they probably slipped around a lot. Their muscles probably weren't very strong. Their fins probably weren't very strong. But over time, uh, those things got better and better and better. And then fish could walk on land. And then we had amphibians, for example. So evolution kind of just happens very slowly over time to make it, it help whatever makes an animal good at something keeps getting better and better over time. Weird, but does that help? <laughs> we can talk a little bit also just about the history. So the very oldest fish, fishes that we know about were kind of eel-like um, and they didn't have jaws. So they just sort of had an opening, but they couldn't bite. Um, and at some point they, um, they uh, the, the sort of, really important thing was was actually I mean this is this is for us too they they evolved to stiffen up the backbone and they started getting uh, harder elements in there and that let you know if you think like a worm if a worm tried to to bend from side to side to swim it's all it's just squishy the whole body would just kind of squish up and so what really helped sort of early fish get started was the fact that they evolved a stiff backbone and that let them pull it from one side to the other, which gives you that tail moving from side to side. And then sort of gradually other elements in the body got stiffer, they evolved jaws so they could bite things. Um, and then we started to get all of the diversity of different body shapes that we have. Um, but that, that sort of original kind of eel-like form is still around. We still have some fish that look like that as well. Great. Thank you for tackling that tough question. <laughs> Evolution is never easy to explain. Um, so now before we move on to audience questions, which we're getting some really great questions and I'm excited to get to those. Um, I just want to ask really quickly, what is what excites you the most about studying fish and the way that fish swim? I just think they're beautiful. You know, <laughs> I think, uh, you know, I, I um, you know, I can watch them swimming around and, you know, the different ways they move, the different body shapes. It's just, it's wonderful to watch. And, um, you know, the more, more I learn about it, the more I understand about it, the more it's interesting just to watch fish swimming around. Uh, I think they're, <laughs> they're uh, really neat because uh, to me, they're kind of like athletes. Um, so, I'm an athlete and I like doing things well. And there are many things that fish can do much better than we can. So they can swim much more easily in water than we can. They can jump out of water much more easily than we can. They can do all sorts of really cool things. And I like understanding how they can do all of those various things. My kind of go-to answer for this question is that fish can kind of do everything going off of what Keegan said a little bit. Uh, if you can think of like, a behavior or a type of thing that an animal does, there's probably a fish that can also do that. So fish can walk, fish can climb trees, fish can kind of fly a little bit, um, fish can do everything. So if you're looking to study locomotion diversity or different ways different animals move, that you can do it in fish and you can stay in the same group of animals. Oh, that's amazing. I, I did not know that. I'm learning so much about fish. 
All right, and there we have a whole bunch of questions coming in from our audience who also want to learn more things about fish and the way they move. So let's go ahead and get to those questions. Um, so we have a question from Oscar. What is the fastest fish in the sea? Pretty sure it's the blue marlin. I think that's the one they've clocked at the fastest, if I'm not mistaken. What do you think, Eric? Does that sound about right? Sounds about right to me. I mean, there's a whole, there's a group of fish, the sort of marlins and some of the billfishes, some of the tunas that are all really, really fast. And it's actually, it's really hard to, to say which is the fastest because somehow you have to, you know, keep up with them in a boat, but also not, you know, scare them off or mess up how they swim. So it, it's actually kind of tricky to say which one is really the fastest, but there's definitely, uh, those, those are some of the fastest. Are there any characteristics of really, really fast fish that are similar among the fastest of the fish? Well, this is one really cool thing about evolution, I think, is that there's this group of really fast fish, so the marlins and some of the billfishes and some of the tunas, and they all have this, this really sort of wing-like uh, tail. So if you imagine the tail um, almost looks like a, a an airplane turned on its side and it's really streamlined um, and it sort of tapers down to that wing-like tail. But then there are some sharks which are nearly as fast. Um, and if you look in those groups of sharks, you see that same shape of the tail, and the same shape of the body. And so, so evolutionarily, they've sort of figured out what's going to be the fastest shape and sort of converge to the same kind of, kind of body. Um, Cool. All right. So now we have, oh, this is interesting. Um, and Cassandra, you just kind of brought this up. Um, I have a question here. How do fish go up fish ladders and why is that helpful to them? Is What is a fish ladder? I, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I'll tell them what a fish ladder is and you yeah. can tell them how they, so if the fish ladder is, is something, if you haven't heard of it, it's what fish used to like people set them up to help fish migrate um so like if they've put a dam up or something which blocked up a river that a fish that fish used to migrate up people will put fish ladders up there so that um they can actually continue their migration even though they've dammed up the up the river and keegan talk about how they do it <laughs> so the i think usually these are for things like salmon and those sorts of things and so Salmon are pretty good at jumping out of the water. So if you imagine kind of basically a little set of stairs where the water gets gradually higher, the salmon can jump out of the lower water level and into the slightly higher water level and do that over and over again to get up the really tall dam. Um, there's also some weird fish though that can actually climb up like a vertical surface. So some of them have, I think it's like a, a fin on the bottom of them that's been modified into a suction cup essentially and they can use the suction cup to stick to something and then jump up a little bit and stick again and jump up a little bit and then stick again. So there's kind of different ways that different species have managed to get up things that you wouldn't expect a fish to be able to get up. So one of the fish that I mentioned early on, I said that very early fish didn't have jaws for biting things. So one of the fish we study in our lab is one of those fish that's still around and all it has is kind of a sucker and so they, they're called lampreys and they can suck onto a wall and jump up and suck on a little bit, bit more. And they can actually go uh, up pretty, pretty straight vertical surfaces sometimes. Wow. <laughs> I was thinking when you started answering that question that, oh, I was picturing fish actually climbing a ladder, which seems silly, but it sounds like there are fish that can actually kind of do that. <laughs> that is super cool. Aren't there like polypterist like studies where they climbed a sort of ladder, like a like a ramp with little slats on it? I feel like I remember reading about that at some point. But yeah, they, I think they can climb. They can almost climb actual ladders. <laughs> <laughs> so they've, cool. Yeah, they they've looked at fish sort of pushing against pegs. Yeah. So 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 going going up sort of a slanted surface. If you put just a few pegs here and there, they they can kind of 
wrap around the pegs and push themselves up that way. So it's not exactly a ladder, but it's not too far off. But that's not a fish ladder. A fish ladder is more, it should be called a fish staircase. Um, uh, yes. <laughs> Um, all right, so let's get back to our questions here. Um, we have another question about how long fish can swim. So are there some fish that, you know, like we think of land animals, like a cheetah can go really fast, but only for a short period of time, but then like wolves have more stamina. Are there sort of, is there a, are there fish that are like that? <laughs> can I, can I take this one? So, and can I show a video? Um, Yes, please. So, all right, I'm going to, let's see, I'm going to share my screen. Um, so, so this is a video of an eel swimming in what we call a flow tank. Um, so here is the eel's body. You can see it's waving back and forth. And this is kind of like a treadmill for, uh, for a fish. Um, so it's swimming, the water is moving past it, but it's swimming in place and staying where it is. Now, one of my, my favorite experiments um, from, uh, from the early 2000s, um, so eels do this huge long migration. They can swim um, all the way uh, from rivers on the East Coast all the way out to the center of the Atlantic Ocean over many months. And the set of researchers wanted to know, you know, is this hard for them? Does it take, you know, how do they manage this? And so what they did is they, they took an eel and they put it in a tank like this um, when it was about ready to migrate and they started it swimming. And then they went away for about six months because that's about how long the migration takes. And then, you know, they checked on the fish every day, but they kept it swimming every day, all day, 24 hours a day for about six months. Um, and at the end of that six months, they checked to see, you know, how much, you know, had the fish lost weight? Were they, were they down on energy? And they were totally fine. It really wasn't a problem. They'd been swimming 24 hours a day continuously for like six months. They were totally fine. Um, and that's sort of normal. Um, so it's, uh, they're probably fish that can do it even more than that. Um, some fish, the other thing is some fish can't stop swimming. In fact, there are sharks um, and some other fish that in order to breathe, they have to swim. So they don't have to, so they get um, oxygen from water. Um, and so they have gills rather than lungs. And so the water has to flow over the gills in order for them to get oxygen. And the way they do that, they don't have, they don't breathe. Instead, they just open their mouths and swim forward. Um, and so the water comes in their mouth, it goes over their gills as they're swimming. But if they stop swimming, they stop breathing. So, so they have to swim all the time. Wow, so sharks must have some amazing stamina. And it sounds like a lot of other fish do too, just constantly swimming. That's amazing. All right, well, I have a question here from Zay. Um, so do you all know if fish sweat when they swim super fast? So it sounds like there are some really super fast fish out there. Uh, do, do they need to sweat like we do? They're in the water, no. Uh, good, hi. Uh, fish don't have sweat glands, so they don't really sweat like, like we do, but they do uh, have liquid on their on their skin, so they have a slime coat, um, and it's exactly what it sounds like. It's a thick, depending on the type of fish, a thinner, thick layer of slime that goes around their whole body, um, and it doesn't help cool them off like like our sweat does, but it helps them. Uh, it a lot of the things it does, it helps keep uh, stuff from sticking to their skin, so it helps them not have parasites, um, and for some fish, it helps them fight off predators. So if a predator bites onto a fish, they can slime more. And that slime will get into the predator's mouth and they'll let go because they don't want to have a face full of slime. So no, they don't really sweat, but they, they do slime a lot. I never knew that. Slime is such a cool fish superpower. Um, all right. So we had some questions about sharks and sleeping, which Eric answered. 
um, which is super cool. I had that same question as well. I wondered if I had heard that about sharks, that they needed to keep swimming. Um, so we have another question that um, is about dolphins and fish and the way that they swim. So dolphins swim right kind of like this with their tail going up and down and fish swim like this. So um, do you know why dolphins swim like that and fish tend to swim more side to side? And maybe you can tell us what the difference between a dolphin and a fish is? I could try and do this and you guys can correct me if I get this slightly wrong. <laughs> so dolphins are mammals like we are. Um, fish are not mammals, they're fish. Um, and the, maybe not the biggest, but the biggest difference in this particular context is the direction that the backbone can bend. Um, so if you think about you or I, we are also mammals just like dolphins and we can bend forward and touch our toes, bend back a little bit, and it makes sense for us to bend in that particular direction. Fish, their spine is rotated 90 degrees. So when we bend to our side, that's kind of difficult for us to do as far as we can bend forward. But for fish, it's really easy for them to bend side to side because of the way their vertebra are interlinked. So there's kind of limits on how much we can bend forward and backwards because of the shape of our, the little pieces that make up our spine. Fish are similar, they're just in the opposite direction. So fish bend side to side really easily. And dolphins are mammals like us and they bend forward and backwards really easily. We were talking about evolution before. Uh, dolphins and other mammals that live in the ocean, they actually started off on land and then went back into the ocean. So that's why they have those shapes that are similar to us. They're actually very closely related if you think about like a hippopotamus or an antelope or something that has hoofs. That's the closest land relative to whales and dolphins. So that's why their backbones are weird. But the interesting thing in terms of sort of the physics is it doesn't really matter. You know, once you're under the water, if you're going up and down or side to side, it, the, you know, gravity actually doesn't matter too much because they're, they're basically floating in the water. So the, the pull of gravity doesn't change things too much. So it doesn't really matter whether you're swimming side to side or up and down. Physically, it's kind of the same. And there are a few fish out there you know, they, they bend from side to side, and most of the time that means they're keeping their, their bodies sort of upright. Um, but there's some fish that don't really mind swimming on their sides, um, and so they'll turn a little bit. There are some fish that swim nose down or nose up. Um, and again, if you're deep enough below the surface of the water, it doesn't really matter. Um, the, the way the water moves around you is going to be the same. Great. Um, all right, so we have um, a clarifying question about the sharks. Um, well, very interested in the sleeping sharks. And so you talked a little bit about how they, they do have to keep swimming. Um, do you know, let's see, how they stay asleep while they're swimming? So I don't know much about fish sleep. Um, Many fish are less active in the nighttime, um, but whether that really corresponds to sleep like we sleep, um, I don't know. Um, and for the fish that swim all the time, um, you know, they, if they sleep, they'd have to do it while they're swimming, but I'm not sure if they sleep. I guess we know a little bit about dolphins, I've heard, that dolphins do uh, swim at night, and what they can do is half of their brain, apparently. I, I haven't read these studies, so it, it could be myth, but half of their brain sleeps at a time, so the other half is sort of able to uh, stay awake and keep them swimming. But I think, um, yeah, I don't know. Cassandra Keegan, do you know anything more about fish sleeping? <laughs> I think the idea of actually defining what it means to sleep is actually a much more complicated question <laughs> than any of us would know. And so like being able to define a fish as actually being asleep is I think problem number one in terms of getting to, to this sort of, to answer this question at all. So I don't know that I know much more than Eric has said there, but other than like, 
we can sort of say, oh, yes, we're asleep because we experience it all the time and have figured out ways to kind of measure that and talk about it specifically for how we experience it. But we don't necessarily know how a fish would experience sleep if it does indeed do it. And so that's, I think, the kind of one of the biggest problems in answering that question. So probably if you're interested in answering it, there's somebody out there who's trying to answer it and you will probably be able to help them when you get a little older. I'm assuming you're one of the younger folks in the crowd. You might actually be able to come up with the answer to that question because I don't think we actually know for sure at this point in time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, thank you for that, Keegan. It looks like that question was from Audrey, age six. So thank you for that really interesting question. Um, and that um, leads me into the last question that I have for you, because unfortunately, it looks like we are out of time. And I'm so sorry that we didn't get to all of the wonderful questions that were submitted. Thank you so much for submitting them and being so curious about fish and the way they move. Um, but before we head out, I just have one final question for all of you, which is, do you have any kind of words of wisdom or advice um, for any of our young listeners out there who are thinking about maybe studying um, fish biophysics or animal locomotion or maybe even just science in general? I go can add, oh, go ahead, Eric. Go out and look at animals. Um, you know, if you wanna study fish, get, get uh, a snorkel. And, you know, if you can go out and swim and just look at fish moving around. You can get an aquarium at home. You can watch them that way. Um, there are fish at the museum. Uh, you can go see them there. Um, you know, the, the, one of the things I really love about our field is the fact that we can see the things we study. You know, scientists who study bacteria are doing really important things, but you can't just look at the bacteria. Um, so we can see fish, so you can go see fish too. Further to that, while you're watching your fish or whatever it is that you're interested in watching, ask questions. There's no such thing as a bad question. Chances are, if you're thinking of it and you have that question, somebody else has either had that question and can give you the answer, or we don't know. And that's when it's really exciting and really fun. And that's like most of the fun of science is that we get to ask these questions that we don't actually know the answer to. And then we get to be some of the first people to figure out what the answer is. All of that is amazing advice. Um, in addition to asking your questions, um, don't be afraid to reach out to your teachers or folks like us. A lot of the times we're willing to answer questions. If you go onto university websites and find our email, if your parents help you out or if you're a little bit higher up in the uh, academic train, like if you're in high school or something like that, um, just if you find some a researcher that you think their work is interesting, shoot them an email because more than likely they're willing to answer your questions for you. Uh, we really love talking about our science, so definitely bother us all the time. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much for that advice. That is really great to know. And yeah, if you want to poke around on websites, go visit a university and check out the scientists. Cassandra has offered everyone up. <laughs> For her questions, which is wonderful. There are so many science, scientists out there who are happy to chat with you, just like these folks have today. And I thank you all so much for being here. So I'm gonna give our wonderful panelists a chance to say goodbye. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, thanks everyone for coming. All right, thank you so much. Um, you can all go ahead and turn your cameras and microphones on. We thank you so much for being here. Now we have a lot more going on over at MOS at Home. So please do check us out on um, social media or visit us at mos.org slash MOS at Home to see what we're up to. And if you enjoyed this program, please consider uh, supporting the museum by visiting us at engage.mos.org slash welcome. Your support will help us ensure that we can continue these online STEM experiences, uh, making them available free of cost and at home. And thank you again so much to everyone for submitting your wonderful questions. We had so much fun with you today and thank you again to our panelists and we will see you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>